Hi, my name is Robin Wong. I'm a photographer based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Welcome back to another episode of Robin Speaks. This is a video podcast series where I talk about random photography topics. OM Digital Solutions, they have just announced a new camera, the OM5. It is supposed to be a replacement, a successor to the highly popular Olympus OM-D EM5 Mark III. EM5 Mark III is my favorite camera. It is my main camera that I use to shoot most of my YouTube videos. This video is filmed on the EM5 Mark III so the replacement it is a highly anticipated camera and I have a lot to say about the new OM5 so let's do this Before we start, here are some important disclaimers. I am no longer connected or have association with OM Digital Solutions. I was the ambassador or visionary for quite some time, but I have left them for about one year. I made a video to talk about that. I'll put the link to the video up here. Please check it out. Currently, I'm not tied to any camera brands. I'm not tied to any company and I'm free to say whatever I want to say. Also, this video is not to bash or to talk ill about any cameras or any brands out there. I am a photographer, I genuinely love all cameras and I do want to see progress. I do want the camera brands to survive and I do want to see better and better cameras to be released out there. So I have some opinion about the newly launched OM5. Earlier this afternoon, I had a photo shoot. It was a job, I was covering an event. In the middle of the shoot, I received a text message from my friend Mati Sulanto, all the way from Finland. He asked, hey Robin, have you seen the news about the product that's launched by OM system? Have you watched any videos? I was like, wow. I was, my mind was so preoccupied with the shoot. My priorities was to get the moments, to get the shots that I need for my client. And there you go, OM system just launched a product at that time. So I replied to Mati Slanto a little bit later. I said, hey, I haven't seen the news, but I roughly can figure out that it must have been the OM5. I have been following the rumors for quite some time and it's about time that the EM5 Mark III gets replaced. And I was quite excited about this news. After the shoot, on the way home, I was taking the train. I had about 30 minutes, so I quickly catch up on the news. I watched a few videos by DP Review and some, some of the ambassadors like Peter Forsgaard to have a quick idea on what's happening, main specifications of the new OM5. And I thought to myself, hmm, this is interesting. I do have some thoughts I want to share. I do have some opinion about this new product, just based on the specifications. That's why I'm making this video now. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't have the OM5. Obviously, I've just mentioned I have no connection to Olympus or OM Digital Solutions anymore. I haven't seen the product. I haven't touched the new OM5. So whatever I'm talking about is just purely based on specifications. This is not a review. I'm not bashing the camera. I'm not talking about, oh, this is a bad camera, a new camera. I'm not making any conclusions. But based on what I see so far, man, I really think that, you know, OM Digital Solutions, they are repeating the mistakes that was made by Olympus before they got sold to the new company. It is happening all over again. And to be quite honest, I'm a little bit disappointed. As I got home from the shoot, I couldn't jump into this video right away. I had to quickly do some post-processing for the images that I've taken in the afternoon. I have to deliver it to my client. It took me about two hours to wrap up all my edits after everything is done. Then I start to dive into this OM5 by OM Digital Solutions. 
I take a deeper dive into the specifications on the official site. I look at all the major reviews, whatever that's available out there. Recently, I actually made a video to talk about the mistakes that Olympus did that led to their downfall. I'll put a link to the video up here. Please check it out. That video stirred quite a lot of reaction from everyone. Some agreed with me. Some said that I was being too harsh. Some pointed out that, hey, you know what? You are not supposed to talk ill about your previous employer or, you know, now that you're no longer ambassador, you're against them. This is sour grapes, whatever that means. Grapes are supposed to be sour, right? I enjoy grapes being sour. So why, why are you talking about sour grapes? I know that it is a figure of speech, but seriously, guys, I have an opinion. And whatever they have said in the video, Everything that I've said, that I have said that previously. I've said them before, nothing is new. I'm just putting them in the same place. And the scary thing is, the points that I made in that video, the mistakes that led to the Olympus downfall, you can see that those mistakes are being repeated in the new OM5. Number one, not much improvements. The new OM5 is basically the same as the old EM5 Mark III, and this is a problem. Now, if you take a few steps back into the first original OMD, the EM5, it was new. There was nothing like EM5 before. It was the first truly capable mirrorless camera. It was a game changer, and it sets the template for all other OMD cameras to follow. It was small, it was lightweight, it's magnesium alloy body, it was weather sealed, it was built in EVF, it was fast in autofocus, it has amazing image quality. It's truly a professional camera. It has some really great features, and it's all packed into a really, really compact and portable body, right? And all the future OMD cameras have similar features, and it has become the footprint and the DNA for a lot of other mirrorless cameras to copy as well. A lot of other brands, a lot of other cameras out there, even full frame, Canon, Sony, they replicate this template from that EM5. So it was a highly successful camera EM5 is a significant product for Olympus or OM Digital Solutions. Then when you look at EM5 Mark II, there were some huge improvements from EM5 and then we have EM1 and after that EM5 Mark II, EM5 Mark II was the first serious video-centric camera from Olympus. It has all the great video features, you have the amazing 5 axis image stabilization for handheld video, the video quality is significant significantly improved. There were a lot of things that work really well in the camera and the EM5 Mark II introduced the high resolution shot, 40 megapixels, where it was a composite of pixel shift images and it was amazing. It blew a lot of people's mind off. It was, again, another game changer and I love the EM5 Mark II, right? And then many, many years later, we have the EM5 Mark III Although the jump isn't that significant, but we have an, an improved image sensor. It brought the EM5 closer to the EM1 series camera. Now we have the 20 megapixel image sensor, which are similar to the EM1 Mark II and the EM1X, right? And then we improved the image stabilization and we added some computational photography features as well. We, we do get pro capture mode and we have fast electronic shutter and we have 4K video and the EM5 Mark III, you know, it's, it's pretty much a mini EM1 Mark II. And compared to the EM5 Mark III, in comparison to the EM5 Mark II, there were, there were a lot of improvements. It was a significantly better camera. Now comparing EM5 Mark III to the new OM5, now look at the camera, same image sensor. So we don't expect any improvements in terms of resolution, dynamic range, and high ISO. We get exactly same image output from these two cameras, EM5 Mark III and OM5. I don't even need to test the camera to know this, all right? You can't squeeze that much out of an old sensor. It is basically the same. If they can, I'll be glad to be proven wrong. But for now, I would gladly assume that both cameras produce the exact same image quality. A new camera, a successor, with no improvement of image quality. And it has the same speed and buffer. 10, 
frames per second mechanical shutter, the burst sequential shoot, and also 30 frames per second for electronic shutter. This is exactly the same with the EM5 Mark III when we look at the specifications of the OM5. And now in terms of video features, there were not much improvement as well. Yes, now that there's no limit of 30 minutes recording, but everything is the same. It is still capped at 4K 30, right? And then yes, the image stabilization improved. That's what happened every iteration from EM5 to EM5 Mark II, EM5 Mark III. In fact, when I look at the EM5 Mark III, I was already so happy with the image stabilization that even if there's any improvement, I don't really care anymore. It's not like something that will drastically, you know, have a game changing kind of results. I already can hand hold down to four to five seconds when I'm shooting with wide angle. What, you want to hand hold to 10, 20 seconds? I don't need that. If I'm truly serious about long exposure photography, I will invest in a really good tripod. So the point is the image stabilization is already very, very good. And what else is there? The camera basically uses the same electronic viewfinder panel, the 2.36 million dot uh, EVF, and it also uses the exact same LCD panel at the back of the camera screen. Same articulating swivel screen, same LCD, same EVF. Even the design of the camera is exactly the same. The layout of the buttons and everything is exactly the same. And another thing about this, this camera is, yes, it's improved, what, IP53 weather ceiling, but is it really improved? Just because they put and a rating on it, IP53, it doesn't mean that the weather ceiling on the newer cameras like the OM1 or the OM5, it doesn't mean that the weather ceiling is better than the previous cameras. Olympus or the OM system, they have always been very conservative when they claim something. And I know this because I worked for them before I've spoken to the R&D team. They were very confident that the, the weather ceiling, the splash proof and the dust proof capability is way beyond what they claim. So perhaps the original EM1 Mark II, EM1 Mark III, the EM1X, they already have the same level of weather ceiling as whatever they have today. It's just that now they're more confident to put a label on it which of course goes through certain certification with the IP rating. And now that people see the rating, of course, people are more confident to have that claim, right? That the weather ceiling is perhaps the most capable out there, but it doesn't mean that it's improved. I can really, really be confident to say that, yes, the weather ceiling is perhaps a little bit better, but we already have amazing weather ceiling in the previous cameras. So you can't say that, ah, oh, this is a huge improvement. So out of all this, yes, the added competition of photography and OM5, like um, Live ND, for example, or Starry Sky Autofocus, or what else uh, did, did they add? Oh, handheld high resolution shot. But these are not deal breakers, or these are not the kind of improvements or capabilities that will sway new people to buy the camera or upgrade from the EM5 Mark III. So having the camera basically giving you the same speed, same image quality, same performance, performance, even the autofocus system, the hybrid autofocus is the same, 121 points autofocus, right? So having same autofocus, same image quality, it is the same camera with just tiny tweaks and tiny feature upgrades. I think that's, to me, it's quite disappointing. The second point I want to talk about the OM5 is a huge thing, ignoring customer feedback. When the EM5 Mark III was launched, nobody questioned about you know, the image quality. Yes, it is micro four thirds. You know, if you want better image quality, you go for full frame or APS-C. And it's already the best at that time. It's the best of any micro four thirds camera can offer the 20 megapixels image sensor. Now, nobody questioned about the autofocus or everything else, right? So the EM5 Mark III was basically a mini EM1X or Mini EM1 Mark II, and it was performing really well for what it is. But a lot of people are not happy with the plastic build. Now, don't get me wrong. During my original review, I did touch about this, but I was perfectly fine with plastic. As an engineer, I understand that plastic is not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of the parts of an aeroplane were made from plastic. A safety helmet was made of plastic. You don't complain when you go to a construction site or you, when you need a protection gear, you wear the helmet and say, oh, I don't want the helmet. I doubt that this helmet can protect my head. I want a metal magnesium alloy helmet. No, it doesn't make sense. The plastic is still really, really strong. And it's strong enough to protect your head at a construction site. Now, if that's true, then I don't see a problem with the plastic build, but 
you can't deny that a lot of people complain about the plastic build. It's not about whether the camera is strong enough or not. It's more about inspiring confidence. I think that when EM5, EM5 Mark II, they were made of magnesium alloy and when you held the camera, it felt really solid. And that inspires confidence. And taking that away and replacing it with plastic, it makes it feel cheap. And people don't like that. And a lot of people are very vocal about this. They just don't like the plastic build. And yet, the OM5 is using the exact same material. I'm not surprised if it's the exact same um, outer chassis from the EM5 Mark III, just with a little bit of tweaks. And this is disappointing because it shows that the OM Digital Solutions, they ignored, they're not listening to what everyone is saying. The third mistake was actually the same mistake that they did in the EM5 Mark III. The OM5, for whatever reasons, the OM Digital Solutions decided to use micro USB port. My goodness. It is the end of the year 2022. We are coming to 2023. And there is still a micro USB connection in a camera that is launched now. It shows how slow and how backward the company is. I'm sorry I have to be this harsh. I said the same thing three, four years ago during the EM5 Mark III. I said exact same thing. I said, we want USB-C. That micro USB is unforgivable. And we still get micro USB for charging through the USB to the camera, for transferring images. It is just unacceptable. How is it that they can put in the USB-C in the EM1 Mark II, which was launched in 2016, that six years ago, they already have the USB-C and it can't put it in the EM5 series. I just don't get it. The EM1X, EM1 Mark III, and of course the OM1, they all have the USB-C and it shows that they have it. They just don't want to use it for whatever reason. If you're saying that it's cheaper, I don't believe you because the demand is that everyone wants everything USB-C. I would prefer to just carry a, one type of cable when I travel. USB-C to charge my laptop, USB-C to charge my phone, and USB-C to charge my camera. One cable or two cables with the same connection on the go, everything is unified, everything is simplified. It just makes my life so much much easier. I don't want to carry a different type of cable and I don't know, this just shows how out of touch they are and I, I don't know how long this is going to happen. Are they still going to use micro USB for the next OM5 Mark II? Or are they going to use it? Oh, finally, the OM5 Mark II, three years later, we have an upgrade now, it's USB-C. I don't know, but the fact that they have micro USB, it just really annoys me. When OM1 was launched, a lot of people were happy and they pointed out that, wow, you know, finally, after all these years, OM Digital Solutions, they reworked the menu system and it's easier to navigate, it is more modern, and finally, there is some improvement in the camera menu. Why don't they just use that in the OM5? Why did they use the old menu system? I, I don't get it. <laughs> I thought moving forward, having the same menu system for all the camera uniform across the new, all the new cameras that's launched by OM system, right? OM1, OM5, and maybe OM10 to replace the EM10 series or the PAN series, whatever the new cameras, they should all use uniformly same, similar, synchronized menu system so that all OM system users will be easier to interchange between cameras. Like if I, let's say one day I, I want to buy an OM1 and I'll be buying the OM5 as a backup camera and I'm shooting both cameras side by side for my shoots, right? The main camera will be OM1 and the, the backup or the second camera will be the OM5 that looks like a good setup for a professional camera. One proper camera and one smaller camera. Having two cameras with different menu system? No. It just makes things very confusing and very difficult to work with. Now, this wasn't a problem previously for all Olympus cameras because EM1, EM1 Mark II, EM1 Mark III, they, the menu system, the layout, they were all 
almost the same. Yes, there are some differences there and here. Some items were at different tabs, but the way you navigate and the way you look around for, for the settings, they were very similar. That's how I can make my tips and tricks video and they can be applied across to a lot of Olympus cameras all at once. Now, they changed that in OM1, I understand moving forward is a new company, they have a new way of doing things, and Olympus Mini System was not the best to begin with. It can be simplified, it can be better, I admit that. So they have a new one. Good. I haven't used the OM1, I can't say how much better it is, I can't say how easy to use it is compared to the O1, but the fact that they are making an effort to change it, that's a great news. But <laughs> There's one step forward and then take two steps backward with the same old menu system in the OM5. I don't get it. <laughs> I really treasure that, you know, the previously Olympus, all the cameras are very similar, all the cameras is easy to work from one to another. But now it seems like we have two different cameras from two different eras and Mind you, this is the first camera, OM5 is the first camera that carries the OM system brand. Shouldn't it use the new menu system from OM system rather than Olympus? Again, it doesn't make any sense. My final complaint, the fifth mistake that the OM5 made, was also a replication from the mistake that led to the Olympus downfall. Video capabilities. When we look at the OM5, when we look at the video capabilities, it was almost similar to the EM5 Mark III. I think there were only two differences. One, you can have the OM Log 400 now, which was only available to the EM1 series camera previously, the EM1 Mark II, EM1 Mark III, and the EM1 X, right? And of course the OM1. Now the new OM5, you have access to the OM Log profile as well. This one change. And the second change is there's no longer a limit, the 30 minutes limit to continuous video recording. You can record as long as your battery and your memory card permits you. So the 30 minutes limit is lifted. So those are good news, but those are also very, very small changes in terms of video output. In terms of video quality, it is still an 8-bit video. I would thought that, hey, maybe moving forward, you know, listening to the customers, looking at the demand of content creation, YouTubers, TikTok, you know, people are making video these days. When they buy a camera, they want a hybrid camera. They want a capable video camera. I would thought that a 10-bit video will be moving forward, right? And maybe they can't do that, so that's fine, but at least give us 4K60 and it's still stuck at 4K30. My goodness, people have 4K60 like five years ago. Why can't Olympus or OM system have it today? You know, I understand that maybe, you know, the EM5 Mark III several years ago, three years ago, the camera doesn't have the 4K60 because, you know, that should be a, a, a feature that's reserved for the high-end cameras like the EM1 Mark III and the OM1. So EM1 Mark III was released, we don't get 4K60, and the OM1 was released, and yes, we finally get 4K60. But now I'm talking specifically about the EM5 Mark III. You compare the EM5 Mark III and the OM5, there should be some improvement, right? It can't be the exact same thing. If the video capability is the same, if the photography capability is the same, you're getting the same image output, you're getting the exact same video output, what's the point of having a replacement? Why don't you just continue selling the EM5 Mark III why did you discontinue it and just, you know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I personally want to see more progress in a new camera. I love Olympus. I'm a huge fan of Micro Four Thirds. I believe I've fought for this system longer and harder than anyone out there. I really want to see them succeed. I'm rooting for the OM Digital Solutions. I'm perhaps the biggest fan out there, and yet here I am left feeling disappointed when I look at all the mistakes they have done in the OM5. I know some will comment and say that, Robin, it's not fair for you to make a conclusion so quick. You did not use the camera, and it's not fair for you to make conclusions without having the actual camera and review it by extensive shooting. That's why I've been always mentioning in my video, I will say that if you want to review a camera, you have to go out and shoot, you know. But this time, it's a little bit different. 
I don't think I need to use the camera to know that the image quality is the same. I don't think I need to waste my time to test the video capability because if the image quality is improved, if the video quality is improved, if the autofocus is improved, if the build quality is improved, OM system would have made it in the front page. It would have been the highlight of the specifications. Oh, we have a new sensor, improve high ISO performance. Oh, we have better video shooting. We have all these new specs. There would have, the fact that there were no such highlights, it just shows that everything, all the important things about the camera on the OM5, they were exactly the same with the EM5 Mark III. And man, I really wish, I really wish that they put more effort to make it a better camera. Having said all that, now, the OM5 is not all bad. Knowing that it's exactly the same with EM5 Mark III, even on today's standard, it can still perform and deliver good results. I personally shoot with the EM5 Mark III regularly for my street photography, for my shutter therapy sessions. It is quick, it can get me really good shots. I get plenty of dynamic range to work with. Even in low light, I have no issue getting shots that are clean using high ISO. I really like that the camera is really small, easy to handle. In fact, the EM5 Mark III is also my default vlogging camera now, besides being the main YouTube camera. It records other videos you see in this channel, but it also records videos on the second channel, my vlog channel, where I talk about non-photography stuff, the food that I eat, the friends that I meet, the events that I attend, the places that I go to. Uh, do check out the channel, I'll put the link up here. Most of the videos, the properly filmed videos, they were taken with the EM5 Mark III. And I think that this almost the perfect vlogging camera. Small light with image stabilization, very good autofocus, it sticks to my face. Uh, I just do everything handheld, I run and gun, I do very minimal edit, straight off the camera footage, it was really good. So I believe that all these benefits are the same on the new OM5, right? Knowing that the specifications are exactly the same. Now, I am still in love with my EM5 Mark III, like I said, I think it is one of the better cameras I recommend to a lot of people here in Malaysia whenever they ask me what are the cameras to buy, what's the new camera to buy, I always say EM5 Mark III or EM1 Mark II, between these two, if you have the budget. If you can't, then of course there's the EPL9, EPL8, or the EM10 series. But if you have the budget, always go to the EM5 Mark III, EM1 Mark II. Maybe not the EM1 Mark III, I have my reasons, I don't want to dive into that, but you get what I mean, right? The EM5 Mark III to me is still a great camera, so of course the OM5 is still going to be delivering fantastic results. I just want progress. I don't want the camera or I don't want the company to stay stagnant. From one generation to another, we expect things to improve, and I don't see enough improvements. I am so sorry. That's all I want to talk about, the OM5. Do you agree with my analysis and early comments on the camera? Do you think that I'm being too harsh on the camera? Or do you have any thoughts? Please leave them in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. Let me know. I'm really curious. Time to answer some questions. Chris Harrington asked, I'm trying to decide between the 40 to 150 f2.8 and the 100 to 400. I'm using EM1 Mark II. Which one would you recommend over the other? Chris, these are two very different lenses. If you want to just purely look at image quality, of course, the 40 to 150 f2.8 Pro will be sharper. It's optically it's superior. The build quality is better. It is everything is better than the 100 to 400 lens. However, it is also short, right? It ends at 150, whereas the 100 to 400, it goes all the way to 400. So what is more important to you? Assuming that you're going for telephoto lenses, you need the reach. Is the longer reach important to you? Are you doing wildlife photography? Are you shooting birds? So the more reach, the better. Then the 100 to 400 is the better solution. If reach is not important, depending on what you shoot, like myself, for example, I don't do wildlife, I don't shoot birds, but I do a lot of events, portraits, I shoot a lot of things on the ground, on the stage. Then the 40 to 150 makes much more sense because I'm not stuck at 100 
at the widest end. I almost can't do anything in real life. So for I do 40 to 150, it's just perfect. And in fact, 40 to 150 is a must have lens. I say, if you are a professional working photographer, if you are a wedding photographer, event photographer, and portrait photographer, that is a truly versatile lens and the image quality that you get out of it is amazing. Whereas reach wise, the further you go, the more you can zoom, then of course the 100 to 400 wins. Depending on what you do, pick the lens that works for you. A few people made similar comment. Glenna11 said, didn't Pentax make an even smaller system? I always wanted one of these little Panasonics. Bruce McLeod said, never had a GM1 or 5, but have the slightly larger GF8. But I think the smallest interchangeable lens camera goes to the Pentax Q series. John Taylor said, as much as I love these videos and micro focus cameras, the Pentax Q series is the smallest interchangeable lens system. And I dare mention the Samsung NX Mini. Guys, go and do the comparison yourself. If you have the Pentax Q and you have the GM1, do the comparison side by side. I don't have both, I only have the GM1, but based on actual dimensions that I can pull from the web, you can't lie, those dimensions are accurate down to millimeters, right? The comparisons of dimensions between Pentax Q and GM1, trust me, GM1 is smaller. If that's the case, if GM1 is smaller than the Pentax Q, you can conclude that the GM1 is the smallest interchangeable lens camera out there. Now I understand it's not fair because the GM1 will take in micro four thirds lenses and micro four thirds lenses are generally larger than Pentax Q lenses. So if you attach the lens, I'm sure the Pentax Q will win. But lens aside, if you're just talking about a camera itself, interchangeable lens camera, just the camera, the GM1 is smaller than Pentax Q. Alex said, you seem like fairly strong guy. Why do you want to struggle with the micro system made for elderly people who struggle with the weight of a full frame? So Alex is claiming that full frame is not for elderly people. Why do I see so many people in their 60s, 70s, or even older, they're using full frame? It doesn't make sense. Now, I don't believe that the camera is made with specific age in mind, right? Oh, you know, micro four thirds is for all people. No, it, I don't think it works that way. I believe that Anyone can choose whatever size of a camera they want to use. If you want to use a large camera, if you want to use a medium format camera, it's up to you. If you want to use a tiny camera, if you just want to use a smartphone, it's up to you. Age is not a factor in choosing camera. The reason why I go for smaller cameras, as I've mentioned before in one or two of my videos, is health benefits in the long run. I've seen my friends broke her wrist shooting with a Canon full frame handling a 7200L lens. Right. And yes, my wrist is possibly stronger than my friend, but possibility of it breaking, fatigue, or me injuring other parts of my body is there. And you know, if I'm hiking or if I'm going to travel, I don't want to have a backpack with two huge DSLRs or full frame mirrorless with like four or five huge lenses, which will be like 10, more than 10 kilograms in total, whereas I can get away with a micro four third system, everything, two cameras full of five small prime lenses, which will in total weigh about two to three kilograms. I'm not even talking about half the weight saving, I'm talking about just a fraction of it. I can save my back. And true story, again, I have wedding photographer friends who are not elderly, they are in their 30s, Another friend is in his 40s, early 40s. They have slipped this handling large DSLRs, full frame cameras. They have slipped this. I'm not kidding you. Right, so if I can avoid that, I'm not that young anymore. I know <laughs> young or old is subjective depending on who I'm talking to, but I'm also starting to consider my future, like I don't want to have a slip disc, I don't want to break my arm, I don't want to have shoulder injury, I don't want to have anything happening to my neck. You know, I want to continue to enjoy photography as long as I can. And if I can get away with smaller cameras, that's, a that's an added benefit. 
Johnny C said, I'm confused. I thought a cloudy day was better for photography since the light is diffuse and there's no hard shadows as opposed to sun overhead at one o'clock in the afternoon. Johnny, it depends on what you want to shoot. If you're doing portrait photography outdoor, directly under the sky, of course, the cloudy day will have a flatter look, the softer diffuse light on the skin. Perhaps that's the kind of shot that you want to do. But even if I want to do portraits, I will not put my subject directly under the sun unless there's a specific effect or look that I want. Let's say a harsh light directly on the face itself. I will usually find a shade or I'll bring in my flash or strobes to shape the light the way that I like it. Now, the reason why I prefer harsh light, I prefer a clear sky, which is not cloudy, when we are shooting street photography early in the morning or late afternoon is for directional light. When the light comes from the side and it's harsh, it creates shadow. Now you mentioned that you don't want shadow, but I want shadow. It was Joe McNally that said, shadow at the right places is your friend. Shadow is important in photography. Photography is not, ju not just about capturing light. If there's just light without shadow, it is not a photograph. A photograph is not complete without both light and shadow. And shadow is important to add depth and dimension to the photograph. Shadow can make the photograph looking more three-dimensional, making it pop. Right, without shadow, it is just, to me, at least for street photography, if I'm shooting buildings, architecture, or any object out in the open, everything just looks too flat and uninteresting. Of course, this is just a preference. You don't have to agree with me. If you prefer the completely flat look, you want the diffuse light in everything that you shoot, that's fine. But I like my shadows. I like my harsh light for my street photography. Whitson asks, who films for you? It's nice to see the reactions to the street portraits. Now, if you're referring to my POV videos where I was walking around on the street taking photographs of strangers and getting their reaction after I show them the photographs I've taken, I film myself using an action camera. So basically I have two hands. On my left hand, I'll be holding the action camera. It's the DJI Action 2. And on my right hand, I'll be holding the actual camera that I'm shooting with. So I'll put the action camera close to my camera, get a shot so that the action camera is capturing what's happening in front of me. So when I show the photograph to the stranger after I've taken their portraits, I will capture both of us with the action camera because the action camera is wide enough to capture everything. I hope that answers the mystery. Boom Balance Hub asked, if you have 14 to 150 Olympus, which lens to choose between 25 f1.4 Leica or 15 f1.7 Leica? This is not an easy question to answer. Now these two lenses, 25 and 15, they are two very different lenses and it's like comparing apples to cats. So 25 gives you a 50 equivalent that's a classical 50 millimeters coverage, something that I personally use a lot for my street photography, whereas the 15 is closer to 28. I know it's equivalent to 30, but it's closer to 28, so it's technically wide angle. So you have a wide angle perspective, you have a slightly telephoto perspective, two are very different focal lengths, they give you different coverage, they give you different kind of output. So if you are undecided on which lens to use, then when you are shooting with your 14 to 150, right? I'm sure you've been using the lens for a while. I'm sure you've taken hundreds or thousands of images with the lens. If you have not, then it's not the time to buy any lenses. Now use the, the 14 to 150, say you have taken 5,000, 10,000 photographs with that lens. Now in that collection of 5,000 or 10,000 photographs, pick 50 photographs that's your favorite. Any photographs, it can be a cat, it can be a building, it can be sunset, it can be photographs of a beautiful model, it can be a, f a plate of, of spaghetti, it can be a flower, it can, can be anything, right? Doesn't matter. Your favorite, the photographs that you like, pick 50. Out of the 50 photographs, analyze the focal length. Which one of them is your favorite? If most of your images are taken at around, say, 25, 30, or 22, or 42, or you zoom into 33, then of course, there you go. Your answer is 
25 f1.4 is a better lens for you because you prefer to zoom to that specific range. But if you see yourself always shooting at a wide end, you're shooting at 14, 15, 17, 15, 16, 14, 14, 14, 14, 14 all the time, then maybe the 15 f1.7 is something that you want to consider as a prime lens to get better results, something you can't do with your 14 to 150. But if you always zoom to say 80, 100 or 50 or 60 or you know you zoom past 40 all the time then maybe you want to consider the olympus 45 f1.8 75 f1.8 instead depending on what you do and your own preferences out of the 50 photographs your favorite ones you will have an idea of what you like to use then that's the lens for you that's all I have to share in this episode of Robin Speaks. What do you think of my analysis for the new OM5? I hope you found it beneficial. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode as well. If you do, please consider buying me a cup of coffee or you can contribute directly to my PayPal. Links in the description below on how I can do that. Any small contribution goes a long way. It will definitely help me to continue making content and publish them right here. Please don't forget to give me a thumbs up, comment, share, and subscribe. And I'll definitely see you again in the next one. Until then, please remember to go out and take more photographs. Bye-bye.